This episode of Tape Facts is sponsored by Pixel Blast, the energy drink you need to game on. Now made from real gamers. Wait, what? Well, another row of the periodic table, another group one metal with a chemical symbol that confuses the English. Potassium's chemistry is very similar to that of its little sister, sodium. Pure potassium, a silvery white metal, has to be stored in oil to prevent it from slowly reacting with oxygen in the air, forming compounds like potassium superoxide, a touch-sensitive explosive. One of the most common sources of potassium in nature is potassium nitrate, otherwise known as saltpeter or nitre. And that's nitre, not nitra, as I've pointed out to more than one of my friends while playing Don't Starve Together. And yes, I am that sad, thank you. You for noticing. Potassium and nitrogen are key nutrients in plants, making saltpeter a highly effective fertilizer. But until the mid 19th century, it was also the primary component of gunpowder, making it an extremely valuable resource in times of war. One of the most readily exploitable sources of saltpeter was guano, which is the nice Latinized name for bat and seabird poo. But as George Orwell famously wrote, some types of poo are more equal than others. European guano was cheap and readily available, but rain and humidity leached it of its potency. If you wanted the good stuff, you had to go to the American. Americas. And if you owned a lot of land that just so happened to be covered in precious mineral-rich bird poo, you could make yourself god-emperor of the poo trade. Putin Carmoon, if you will. One country that capitalised on this was Peru, who was one of the biggest exporters of guano in the 19th century. In the 1840s, the Peruvian government made so much money from the guano trade that it ushered in a 21-year golden age of peace and prosperity, now known as the guano era. But unfortunately for Peruvian seabirds, their poo isn't anywhere near as valuable as it used to be, in no small part due to the invention of the Harbour Bosch process, which allowed cheap ammonia-based fertilisers and cheap ammonia-based explosives to be produced from nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. Check this video for more information about nitrogen chemistry, check this video for more information about Fritz Haber and the process that bears his name, and check this video for potassium chem- oh wait, hang on, that's this video, right, moving on. Potassium symbol K comes from its Latin name Callium, which in turn is derived from an ancient Arabic term from plant ashes. This refers to potassium carbonate, more commonly known to farmers as potash, a crumbly potassium salt used in agriculture as a fertiliser. Potash has been used by humans to grow crops since the Bronze Age, so it's no surprise that making it isn't exactly a PhD level synthesis. Just burn some wood in a big fire, soak the ashes in water, and then leave them to evaporate in a massive iron pot, leaving a nice scrapable layer of potash at the bottom. Actually, wait, scratch that. That sounds exactly like something a PhD student would come up with. While the old-fashioned pot method was easy and relatively cheap, it wasn't particularly efficient. In order for the synthesis to work, the ashes had to be sourced from hardwood trees like oak and maple. And even if you supported a small business by buying the right type of wood from your local forest shaman, the yield and purity of the end product was often, to use a technical term, a little bit on the naff side. As the population of the industrialized world grew, demand was high for more fertiliser, but the methods of potash production didn't really change until an American inventor, Samuel Hopkins, came along. A man who rather annoyingly for me seemed to hate having his bloody portrait taken. Hopkins was able to create a specialised furnace that re-burned the ashes, producing potash much more quickly and in much finer purities ever possible with traditional methods. Hopkins completed his application with the United States Patent and Trademark Office on the 31st of July, 1790. It is the oldest known patent in American history, and was even personally authenticated by President George Washington, who presumably had nothing better to be doing that day. Despite being an incredibly reactive metal in its pure form, potassium ions play an incredibly important role in human health. Potassium is what's known as an essential mineral, an element that humans need for our bodies to function properly, but one that we can't make on our own, so we have to make do with cramming them in our cake holes. Sodium, for instance, is an essential mineral that can be found in all food with table salt, i.e. literally everything on the menu at your local takeaway. But for potassium, you generally have to lean a bit on the healthier side. You probably know that eating more bananas is one of the best ways to get more potassium in your diet, but while a good nana might satiate the desires of your inner chimpanzee, you might not know that every time you eat one, you're giving yourself a tiny dose of radiation. Of potassium's three naturally occurring isotopes, potassium-40, the middle one, is very weakly radioactive, making up about 0.01% of all naturally occurring potassium on Earth. Due to the high levels of potassium in bananas, it's a numerical inevitability that at least some of the atoms you eat will be potassium-40. Now, clickbait science aside, I should stress the radiation from bananas is completely harmless. As mentioned before, potassium-40 is only a very weak source of radiation, with a half-life of about 1.25 billion years, not exactly comparable to eating uranium fuel rods 
on toast. The radiation emitted from a single banana, or the banana equivalent dose, and yeah, that's a real thing with its own Wikipedia page and everything, is around 0.0000029% of the fatal dose. To even come close to this number, you'd have to eat 34,482,759 bananas in one sitting. Enough to give a free piece of fruit to every citizen of Saudi Arabia, or roughly half the daily calorific intake of the average Discord moderator. If anything, we should be grateful we can still buy bananas at all, because they were almost rendered completely unviable for commercial farming. The dominant cultivar of the banana today is the Cavendish, but back in the early 20th century, the top banana was the Big Mike or Gros Michel for the wine-quaffing, cheese-eating francophones among you. In the 50s, practically all of the bananas sold in the English-speaking world were Big Mikes. The thick skins made the fruit resistant to bruising during travel, and the general consensus was they tasted better too. Compared with modern bananas, Big Mikes contain higher concentrations of isoamyl acetate, the flavouring used in banana milkshakes and those foam bananas I usually buy from the ton whenever I have pick and mix. Problem is, if you're a farmer and your entire livelihood depends on a single strain of fruit, you'd better pray to sweet nana Jesus that strain doesn't become susceptible to disease. But unfortunately, sweet nana Jesus is a cruel and capricious god. In the 50s, Central America was hit by a fungal affliction now known as Panama disease, and the banana trade was nearly wiped off the face of the earth. By 1960, Big Mike bananas were almost totally unviable for commercial export. However, a strain of Cavendish banana resistant to Panama disease eventually took its place, and Banana Geddon was mercifully delayed for another day. Now, those of you with keen ears may have noticed I said delayed and not stopped, because we didn't really solve the problem at its source. What led to the demise of the Big Mike wasn't bad luck, but bad genetics. The wild ancestor of the banana is to its modern counterpart what a wolf is to a hairless, deaf-blind pug with flippers where its legs should be. Those little specks in the middle of banana slices are actually the withered, sexless remains of what used to be hard, spiky seeds. Banana trees have been so selectively bred for taste that they're totally infertile, so the only practical way for farmers to make more of them is to clone them by planting the offshoots of a parent plant. The bananas you see in shops are featureless, sterile copies of one another, and while they might have been resistant to the fungi of the 60s, it's only a matter of time before another threat takes its place. So stay vigilant, banana lovers, for the next threat lies across the horizon. Maybe something like nanaborn rabies, or, I don't know, a biblical plague of airborne orangutans.